The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me now in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel. I'll be reading from there this morning. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. <coughs> Excuse me. Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 14, reading through verse 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim and to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O oh God, we pray for ears to hear. Ears that hear your words as they speak to us through Scripture. Ears that hear your words, hearts that are open to receive it. Hands and feet willing, able, and called to do it. To be with us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, you can ask Sally about this later, I suppose, but I've never really been uh, a big fan of when people use the word good Christian. It's implying there are levels of being a Christian. You know, somebody will say, oh, I know old so-and-so, they're a good Christian. As if, you know, you didn't say that they were bad Christians. But at the same time, I do wonder when people use that word, what does it mean? to be a good Christian. Somebody asked you that, what, what, what might you say to that question? Maybe you'd say something about, I don't know, going to church, reading your Bible, praying every day. Maybe you'd say something about tithing or volunteering your time in church and in the community. I don't know. Maybe the more theologically inclined among us might say, well, well, good Christians have right thinking and theology about Jesus, uh, uh, his dual divinity and humanity, something about the Trinity maybe, some dogmatic expression about the Bible. I, I don't know. But I do remember a few years ago when I used to take the paper. You all know what a newspaper is, right? It's this magical thing. It's delivered sometimes to your house. Sometimes there are these boxes you can buy them out of. And even now, you can see them on your computer. It's really something. But I remember a few years ago when I still got an actual paper, reading it in my office, and there was a, an article. I believe it was on a Saturday, back when they ran Faith on Saturdays. The article was titled, Fundamentally Christian. And in it, the author said these words. The Bible is the infallible word of God. God created heaven and earth in six literal days. On the seventh day, he rested. The Son of God was born of a virgin. Heaven is attainable by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. He didn't cite Calvin there, but he should have. Every man has sinned against God, and there is but one escape from the just sentence of hell, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. And everybody who read that on Saturday, a lot of them said, Amen, Amen. But then the very next sentence, this is what got me. Those are the fundamentals. It's impossible to be a good Christian without them. I take issue with that. It's impossible to be a good Christian without them. I couldn't help but notice 
that absent from that list of fundamentals is perhaps the greatest fundamental. Jesus called it the greatest commandment of all. To love God and one's neighbor as oneself. But of course, if we go down that list, down that road of making lists of what it takes to be a good Christian, we might actually find that our lists are a bit longer than we might expect. And we might find that if we ask the person next to us to share their lists, oh, they might not line up. And some of them might not be the same. Or what if we were to ask someone of a different tradition? They would really have a different list, wouldn't they? So, why do we answer that question? What's the answer? What does it really take to be a good Christian? Maybe... Maybe we should ask a different question, one that's less aimed at us personally. What does it take to be a good church? That's a good question. It's got more than one right answer, though. Some will respond and say, well, a good church has good music. A good church has lots of programs, uh, good service hours, social opportunities, maybe even comments about locations. I remember when I was in seminary, we had a guest come in to, to talk to us about church buildings and this sort of stuff. And he said, if you're going to put a sign pointing people to where your church ought to be, that's where you ought to build your church. I said, well, what if your church had been built for 200 years? He didn't have a good response. But a good church, someone else might say, is it's comfortable, filled with people who get along, who like each other, who spend time together. Then there are those, of course, who take maybe that question a little differently. may want to answer it by saying, well, this is the missional activity of the church. This is the way that the church reaches out to the community. But at the end of the day, the truth is you'd likely get just as many opinions about what it takes to make a good church as you do as when it comes to making a good Christian. So both maybe are questions that need, well, not asking or maybe further explanation. Because there's not a definitive answer. Is there some expression, some phrase, some confession one can point to though and go, that's it, that is what it means to be a good Christian? That's it, that's what it means to be a good church? Maybe there is. I, if there is, I haven't found it yet. But if it is there, I imagine it's just below the surface. Behind what I think is maybe the more pressing question for us as a church and as individuals. A question that may seem to have an easy answer until we really try to answer it. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? There's a question with more answers than somebody can imagine. For you, Jesus may mean one thing. For me, it may mean another. For us as Baptists, Jesus is one thing. For Catholics, it may be another. Who is Jesus? For nearly 2,000 years, people have pondered, discussed, and fought over the question, uh, the answer to that very question. Who is Jesus? Is he simply a figure from ancient history, a great moral teacher who inspired a movement that's reshaped the world? Is Jesus the imagined hero of a people who so desperately needed one? Is Jesus the conservative Western figure who preaches prosperity and self-reliance? Is Jesus the poster boy for social rebellion and political uprising in the face of tyranny? Is he the prototype hippie with long hair and sandaled feet preaching about love and tolerance? Or is he the stern judge who seeks to weigh everyone on the balances of sin and righteousness? Who is Jesus? The answer, it seems, depends on who you ask. And I wager that if you were to ask uh, those gathered in that synagogue at Nazareth on that day when Jesus came in, you might get a surprisingly simple answer. You see, to them, Jesus was just Mary and Joseph's oldest son. One who had been gaining a reputation for teaching in the synagogues of Galilee and making an impression on those who had saw him down at the Jordan with his cousin John. But to the people at Nazareth, he was the homeboy, the, the boy of Mary and Joseph. 
He was the same carpenter's son who would come with his family to that very same synagogue to recite the Shema, the prayer of Israel with them, to offer prayers for the community, to sing psalms, to listen to the reading of Scripture, and then when the rabbi sat down in the seat of Moses, to hear the homily that came after. If these folks saw him as anything more, it was with the same vision that countless others of the so-called prophets who sprang up were seen. Those who came around in Judea, who were all gathering a little following, all claiming to be a Messiah or a teacher. Maybe even his ascension to the podium there at the synagogue in Nazareth to read scriptures that day wasn't all that unusual. Perhaps this synagogue in Nazareth was like the childhood church of Fred Craddock. I heard uh, Dr. Craddock one time talk about his little church there in Tennessee when he was growing up. He said it was almost like people would stop in at the filling station on Saturday and go, are you a preacher? No. Would you like to be? We need somebody on Sunday. And they would just come in. Maybe that's the same with Jesus. He just strolled in. We need somebody to read scripture. Jesus, would you like to read scripture? Maybe, maybe speak the homily after. I don't know. But who is Jesus? One might ask them. And the gathering in that Nazareth synagogue would tell you simply, oh, that's Mary's boy. That is until the day it came and he read from the scroll of Isaiah. Now, it's unclear whether Jesus chose to read from the scroll or whether when they handed it to him, he had asked for this scroll or whether he found the text or it was there for the text of the day. But Luke tells us in verse 16 that Jesus stood up, which is the thing you do in a synagogue to read from the Scriptures. He stood up. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now the passage that Jesus reads is from the 61st chapter of Isaiah with a verse or two from verse chapter 58 thrown in there too. But it was a passage they all would have known. They would have set up a little on their seat when they heard Jesus read it. It was a passage that used the familiar language of the year of Jubilee. I like this part of the Old Testament. Because, well, one, we've never done it, and I think we should. And In fact, I should go ahead and ask for a vote right now before I explain to you what Jubilee is, in case you don't know. But the year of Jubilee is mentioned in the book of Leviticus. It was to be observed every seventh of the seven years. In other words, every 50th year. It was a time when the land was supposed to rest. It was a time when debts were to be forgiven. Everyone with student loans say Amen. It was a time when people were supposed to go back home and slaves were supposed to be set free. It was meant to be the Sabbath of all Sabbaths, a time when the people of God and their land would truly rest. It was a time one might think that the people would look forward to. But there's no recorded account ever of the year of Jubilee being observed, even though it's written in the book, in Scripture. Maybe it was too much to ask of an agrarian people to leave their fields alone for an entire year. Perhaps it was too idealistic to think that one's debts could be forgiven simply because it was the 50th year. I know some folks, you do too, that have been like, well, it's year 48. If I don't pay for two years, it'll be forgiven. Or maybe, and I think most likely, people are just plain greedy. And the idea of giving back land that you got from someone else, the idea of freeing your slaves, of canceling the debts that people owed you, that just doesn't sit well with a lot of folks. But whatever the case was, the year of Jubilee became less of a reality called for in Scripture and became one of those things. We do this with things in Scripture we don't like. It became less of a reality and more of a well, what that really means is it became a spiritualized time when God would bring His own sort of jubilee to His people, freeing them from their captivity under foreign authorities. And for the people of Israel, that was always a welcome word because they were always in captivity. 
And the passage from the scroll of Isaiah captures this sort of language about the year of jubilee and liberation of captives and the freedom of the oppressed. And I can imagine it was a sort of passage that stirred up feelings of hope in the hearts of those who heard it in the synagogue there in Nazareth. I mean, the Romans were marching just outside. And here Jesus reads it. Oh man, he's going to say something. That is until what happens next. Jesus preaches a sermon so short that Bob Ford would put you to sleep. In verse 20, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. All the eyes of the synagogue, Luke says, are fixed on him. Because when he sits down, he doesn't just sit down in the pew next to mama. He sits in the seat of Moses. And the people are waiting. What's he going to say? What's he going to say? You get the feeling they're all expecting Jesus, who, who remember now, has gained this reputation around the synagogues. They're all expecting Jesus to say something powerful, to blow their minds with some amazing word about this spiritual jubilee. Maybe they were waiting for him to say something that would only buttress their feelings about the Romans, and they were holding them back from the promise of God's jubilee. You get the feeling that since the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him, And they were eager to hear his words about what he had just read. Tell us, Jesus, what does it say? Make it plain, preacher. What does it say? Tell us. They were waiting for some stirring oration that would propel them towards hope, comfort, and possibly peace. And in some ways, I don't think he disappointed them. Because in verse 21, we're told, as all the eyes are fixed on him, he began to say to them in a one-sentence sermon, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. No parables. No beatitudes. No breaking bread. No turning water into wine. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, at first, I get the feeling they were confused. Is this the way he always does it? You know, I've never heard him live. I've just listened to him on the podcast. Is this how it always happens? Does, it, does he always just say something crazy? What? What? Or maybe there were some who had the same feeling that I can only imagine. Those folks who were sitting in the audience when Oprah gave them a car. They were a little confused. Maybe excited. Some of them said, I doubt it, Right? But it doesn't take long for them to catch on what Jesus means. They know he's talking about himself. And they realize all of a sudden he's claiming to be this fulfillment of their expectations. They heard his words as a claim to be the one of whom the prophet spoke, the one who was going to bring God's jubilee, the Messiah. But they didn't catch it all. For Luke continues to tell us that they were amazed in all of what Jesus was teaching. I think some of them were like, one sentence, we'll beat the others to lunch. But when he continued to speak of the examples of Elijah and Elisha, they become angry. As Jesus revealed in his teaching that the words of Jubilee were for more than just the ethnic people of God. They became angry, wanted to throw him off a cliff because of what he said. Isn't that strange how the real words of Jesus tend to create so much of a reaction from folks? I imagine if you were to ask the people in that synagogue at Nazareth after the fact, who is Jesus? After he read from the scroll of Isaiah, after he spoke those words, they might have a different answer. No, that ain't just Mary's boy. He's that troublemaker who thinks other people are getting in. He's that troublemaker who thinks Gentiles are even a part of God's. Can you believe that? He's that one who thinks he's the Messiah. I even saw him strutting as we chased him towards the cliff. But he wants to offer salvation to everyone, even those outside of our kind. That man is slapped out of his mind. That's probably what they said. Who is Jesus? It says so in the book. He's the one who brings good news to the poor, who proclaims release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, lets the oppressed go free, 
the one who proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. He proclaims release to those who are held captive by sin. He gives sight to those who are blind, those who are blinded by selfishness and the sins that distract us from the needs of others. He frees those who are oppressed by the ways of a fallen world, those who are oppressed by their past, oppressed by the hands that life have dealt them. He proclaims the year of the Lord's favor to those who have been told that God doesn't care about you, that God's too high, too holy, and too far away, and you're too insignificant. Jesus is the one who proclaims to them that the year of the Lord's favor has come even for them. Who is Jesus? He's the one who brings God's jubilee. And he's the one who calls us to do the very same thing. Now, how do I know? I mean, who am I anyway? Because Jesus read it. Right there. It's in the book. In the scroll of Isaiah. How do I know? Because it's all right there in the book. And if I'm going to be one of those people who gives any power, any meaning to this book, if its words mean anything whatsoever, then those words have to mean something. They have to serve some greater purpose than buttressing my preconceived notions of God and myself. If I claim those words have any power, then I'd better listen to them and do what God calls me to do through them. For they are words that call me to action. Action modeled in Christ. Action cited right there in the book. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to hear your words and not be provoked to offense by them. But Lord, may we be provoked to action. To bring about the realities of jubilee in our lives and in the lives of those around us. To be what others might call a good church. To be what others might call good Christians. But Lord, above all, that we may be called good and faithful servants by you. So Holy Spirit, move in this place in this time. Speak to our hearts. Whatever it is, God, we need to turn over to you this morning. Help us to do that so that we may be free, free to be your servants in this world, carrying your good news to all who need it. Come now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.